two in all. Wow. So your time at Hearts, was that a year, two years? Two seasons. And you basically just used this cover, was oh. that as much as you were going to do? Uh, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the T woman was in the squad before me, you know, it was, it was embarrassing and there was some going on. In all these years you wonder why nothing fell out, it fell out with anybody and that, it, was, it was a bit of a clique there, you know, with the Gary McKay's and Big Levine's and John Robertson's and all that. There was an East-West because myself, Slim, Big Roger McDonald, Sandy Clark, Alan Moore, Sandy, Clark, eh, Sandy Stewart, all travelled through, Ian Jardim, we travelled for the West through. Mm -hmm. So there was always a wee bit of divide, but you know the part that were your teammates and you got on me. Uh, um, it was only when Bobby told me that night yeah. that I could nip it light on the subject. I just all filled in. All the, the dots I, joined. I, all the years ago. Oh. All the years ago. Why did he take me? He totally ruined me, Alan McDonald. And the bitterness is still here because he's a Rangers man. Mm -hmm. And he knew, first and foremost, what Rangers meant to me and what it meant not to go back and play against them. Right. And that really hurt me. When Bobby told me that, he says, Bobby, she'll get into me. I says, Robert, I'm glad you've told me. I'm glad you've told me, me man. And I could I could feel myself filling up. I just felt, and all the years later, and Bobby seen me, Bobby knew he'd upset me because they were, they were trying to get a deal for him uh, before me, but Bobby was getting, they were getting Bobby for nothing, but they, obviously to pay a fee. It was half a million quid they paid for me in Slum. 495 was Slum and 5 was for <laughs> me. So they added me, I think it was plus fat. I think that was the fat. <laughs> that was so fat. But you're still, I'm just looking here, the time you're in and out of hearts, you're still early mid 20s. I know, Craig, but you know, if had a couple of boots in the balls, early doors, and you've been at a couple of clubs who take take Aberdeen and sell it away for the Rangers in the Premier League, and Hearts were the nearest thing that I could have got. Mm -hmm. And so, you were probably not fair to say you were not going to end up at Aberdeen or Celtic. So Hearts were the next best thing in Scotland for me after Rangers, when I saw it, because when I went through, any time I went through with Rangers, man, what a, what, you know, what an atmosphere it was, the Jambos, predominantly. The blue noses, the Edinburgh and all that, and they, they knew what they were getting me as well. So you know, the hearts of the fans ever turned on me any time I played. They liked it, you know, the, the way I went about my business. So um, it was then, um, it was a wee bit of a crossroads then, because when you jump in your car and, and you go to training in the morning and the fire in the belly is not there and the laugh's not in the car with the boys and it's a chore, that's when you kind of know that you maybe need to look at Pascal's new. And I still had a wee bit of time left on my contract with, with Hearts. But I remember sitting in the house one night and I guess a phone call. Um, Hello, is that, is that Shucky Burns here? I went, aye, who's that? He says, it's Big Jim Leash, man. I says, oh, how are you doing, Leash? And wee Doddy hadn't even told me he was phoning. He said, I've just spoke to you, uh, I've just spoke to you, uh, wee Doddy and, and Sandy, and they're saying that you could maybe come there and do a wee turn for us, uh, and uh, come over and loan, see how it works out. And I went, the firm when we were a first division team, but they were an up and coming first division team, and we haven't been at the helm, and a great chairman, and they were quite you know, rich for the first division, really. And I went, I can I get back to you tomorrow, Jim? I can I think about it overnight and get back to you? So I went out to Tincastle in the morning, I said, I mean, good of you to tell me. Right, big phone call. Call. He says, oh, he says he phoned and it was late on the time we got away for you and all that, what do you think? I says, I am going to go and play. Um, so I went to loan, uh, they had like four or five thousand there, even hardcore. But can you imagine how hard that is to be, I don't mean a Rangers player one minute, then you're no. That's why a lot of players when they leave Rangers, you never leave Rangers and prove them, prove them wrong. It's hard. Who will ever leave Rangers and becomes a superstar? Yeah, it becomes a bigger player. It's difficult. It's difficult. Because all it used to be up for driving in Jersey and doing the tunnel whew, atmosphere. It'd get you through games, you know. Um, and then that became hard, the hearts. And then it became even more difficult as you go down the ladder. You're not getting up the ladder. It's no snakes and ladders. It's a slidey ladder you're on. Uh, because you're then getting to 23, 24. And you go to Dunfermline, again, didn't really work out for me. I, I, could, I, 
I went mean, through the motions, Craig. I played at it. Um, I got into some bad habits. Started having a few beers when I shouldn't have been. No push myself in training. I'd be phoning in and saying I was unwell when I wasn't and just couldn't be bought. Is it maybe fair to say, use a good Scottish word to describe it, you were scum up? Aye. I was, and even though it was early, I was scum up because the stuffing had been knocked right out of me um, with the way the heart thing had happened and then the family probably should have went, should have went, maybe then down south, early 20s, had a wee go. But then, then the thing did come to go down south to go to Fulham. Mm -hmm. We spoke about that earlier on. Uh, I went down to Fulham and loan. Uh, Ray Lewington, who's had a very, very successful career with Ray, uh, Roy Hodgson, been his wingman for all the years. He's been assistant manager. That was his first gig, was the Fulham job. And I remember big John watching the striker, Fidel Fulham, big ginger striker, scored a lot of goals. He got me down because they were looking for the right back and he says to Ray Lewington, Chuggy's no point of him he'll come down. And I had three great months at uh, uh, Fulham. But they didn't have was a loan at the time. And loan, he didn't have a washer, mate. Jimmy Hill was the chairman. And then I met Jimmy Hill. Um, and he came on to the pitch one day and he went, Oh, you'll be a recruitment from Scotland. Nice to meet you. And I remember being at uh, the Tartan Army and singing, oh. You hate Jimmy Hill. Aye. Oh. And then the next thing I'm shaking his hand, he'd been all Mr. Nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing I thought of. I'm like, Dave, Mr. Hill, I'm saying something about you. Anyway, he was decent. Uh, again, Fulham on the lower tier, fourth division. Fourth division. Shrewsbury. Uh, and again, for the folk that, that's listening and watching, David Moyes was at Shrewsbury. I didn't even know that. Moyes, he got off the team bus. He fell out with Ian McNeil, who was the Shrewsbury manager. We two so looked at one another and I went, what are you doing here? And they went, what are you doing here? So I'm doing loan. He went, oh, I'm trying to back up, bro. That fell out with this twat. <laughs> I don't know what Moises Day knew, to be fair, but... Uh, <laughs> did, he, uh, did he have a career there, boy? Did he go into bigger things? <laughs> but it's mad, isn't it? It's mad. Uh, how then uh, <laughs> he went back up the road and did his badges and the rest of the history. Just, just again, you know, I was talking to you earlier about this. You played for Rangers. You played in all firm games, mm -hmm. right? But I'm just going to read some stuff out to you. And you think uh, anybody else that didn't play for Rangers or Celtic, right? Had this career. Hearts, Dunfermline, Fulham, Fulham, Hamilton Ackies, Kilmarnock, Air, and finishing up at Dumbarton when you're in your mid-30s. Mm -hmm. You compare that to 99.9% .9 of guys who were lucky and fortunate enough to make a career out of football, and that trumps a lot of them, 99% of them. But talking to you, it's as if it get worse. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing better than playing for Rangers, but... You still had an absolutely fantastic, fulfilling career in football, yeah. even taking the Rangers and potentially even the Hearts out, out it. Yeah. You still made money, had a career into your mid-30s and played for some decent, decent teams. Yeah, I, so to say where did it all go wrong, I think that's maybe and, uh, a bit disingenuous. Yeah. Even trying to take that first three, four years as a, you know, up to your 22, 23, you still had a fantastic career in football that would... Many people that me that played football, love football, wanted to be a professional footballer, but just wasn't good enough, would have gave body parts to have. Yeah, because it, it took a wee upswing uh, when I was at Dunfermline, and came back up for Fulham, and I then I used to wind big leashman up about getting a free. I wanted a free because we got a free nowadays. You can get, you know, you got you get a wedge. You can sign oh. for your, you know, whoever you want. But I knew big George Fulson was the man at Hamilton. And I was quite interested in a, in a move to Hamilton. I was back where I was living. It was a central belt. Hamilton had a good team. Kevin McKee, Colin Miller, Paul McDonald, who I've just met down the stair there. Colin Harris, Alec, Alec uh, Ferguson, George McCluskey, some great players. But it was just a, the, the, it was a Douglas Park thing. I go, Fuck, I want to go and play there. Anyway, bottom line is, big leashman, pulls me in. Right, son, I've got you what you're looking for. I've got you a, a Nelson. Right, and I knew what he was talking about right away because at that time, Nelson Mandela had just been freed and we used to sing it at training. Mm -hmm. Free, yeah, yeah. Nelson Mandela. So big leashman, right, I've got you a Nelson, son of a... <laughs> I've got you a Nelson. <laughs> right. I don't forget, I went, oh, big man, high five. And I went, I went in the manager's room. Through to Hamilton that night, went out through the Silver Trees, met Billy McLaren, George Filson. At that time, we McMurdo was still looking after me. 
and I had a great deal off Hamilton. They weighed me in. Wages weren't great, but it was a few quid and it was a chance of playing. So see for the Hamilton, the Kilmarnock and the Air United, see the next six seasons yeah. were very enjoyable. Yeah. Because I was playing and I was wanted and I, I was playing well. I was playing the middle of the park with Hamilton, scoring goals full time. And that was a hybrid, again, how life changes. Um, we had a wee guy, um, pff, wee guy is funny, Billy Reid, who's been on him. We Billy, we Badger was uh, a, a bricky, come in at night, we butts not on at night, and now life changes for him. Yeah. So another good pal of mine, John Horn, I used to wind him up, he came in with us hanging out his trousers. We Horn, a great lad, doing brilliant in life now with other things. So these guys kick on and how people's cha- you know, yeah. life changes, Craig. We're part time, they'll make a lot of money at Hamel, but we're still. Full time, part time women, the hybrid, hybrid, uh, hybrid boys at night. So it was good. And then I remember getting a phone call from Billy McLaren to me, got up the stairs, speak to uh, David Morrison, that there was a deal on to Kilmarnock. Now, that was a great move because I was going from Douglas Park to Rugby Park, from shitey training gear to the best of gear, to three man in a dog at the game to seven, eight, nine thousand. Yeah. So that was a good, a good move because the Fleetings had just got involved at, at Kilmarnock. And I went, good move, I'm going to take that. Through that afternoon, and a player swap deal, Big Billy Stark came to Hamilton to be Billy Clan's assistant, and I went to sign Michael Marlon, Jim Fleeton, Jim McSherry, Frank Coulson, and the late Tommy Burns. And, and the ding-dongs that we'd have in the old firm games, I was right back, Tommy's left. Mm-hmm. Uh, it takes me back to... Um, this is again a, a true one. Talk about the four each game we spoke about earlier on. Yeah. He's pushing me, tackles flying in. I'm trying to get near Tam, couldn't get near him. I dived in at Owen Arts Deacon. We more scored to get him two up. We come back two one half time. Big joke slapping around in the head, get in the pot. We're getting into the dressing room. He's like, you got now, Tam Burns. He's running the show. What am I to get sent after stuff after half time? So Tam Burns at two one does what Tam Burns does. No fun game. And he jinks, and he jinks, and he jinks. He slid it by Nicky Walker. Celtic in. At Ibrox, that's what they do when they're in, right? And he gets doing in the corner, right? And Tam, <laughs> Tam does what Tam does. <laughs> and half the enclosure are they man all. Uh-huh. Fall end, oh, right? And I want to start singing, de, 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 right? Well, good, honestly, gone right now. I, I, I laughed at this when I met him. He says, Tam, you went running by me singing the soldier song. <laughs> right? Right, like, to the beat of the music. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I was like, you bastard. I can't believe it. Right. So we go 3 2, and we go 3 8, and the Rangers go 4 3. So you can imagine what I was singing to Tam Burns at 4 3, and he's looking at me like that. Right? <laughs> he's all but laughing, right? So then we Murdo puts one by Big Short Big yeah. Fingers. Yeah. Four minutes to go, five minutes to go. Big Nicky should have got it. Through his bit. It was a great strike. We murdered him. And we murdered him. Remember, he's standing in the middle of the park like when he scores four each. So that's it. My, 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 remember, my re- recollection of Tam. So it didn't really work for Fleeting, but it worked for Tam because when Tam got a gig there, wow, he just pff, raced everything. And I'm in the team. I'm playing in midfield with wee Gus McPherson. And I'm, in, I'm playing in the middle of the park with Tam. But Tam, Tam Burns, right? Folk asked me about Tam Burns and what was he like and what was he not like. Tam Burns is the sweetest guy I've ever met in my life. But an absolute animal in the park. Aye. Foaming at the mouth, right? Red hair sitting in her eyes bulging at you, right? And he's staring at you and he's shouting at you in the park, but you can ding him, right? You can ding him. And he's shouting at you, oh you, oh you, oh you. But then he's shouting, he's shouting, he's shouting. Dogs abuse. Dogs abuse we get, right? But everybody was fat. Training was good. Practice matches. You know, keep ball, shadow, everything was done at the pace of a game. We were fitter, we were leaner. Tam went like that, boom, loves his up the league. We play St. Johnson quarter final League Cup. I've gave Big Craig Patterson a short pass back. He's gave it away, blah, blah, blah. And we're, we're, lo- we're no leading, but it's not neat, but we're St. Johnson at the time. But we're the league below them. So I pulled my calf muscle, worst injury I had in my life, and I'm in the, I'm in the with Hugh Allen, Scotland physio. I hear the fit steps coming in down the tunnel and I knew he was looking for me right and he came in he gave me dog's abuse right absolute dog's abuse I mean I'll get you back for that you wee bastard right so 
he put me back to the team. A couple of games later, and I'm not forgetting this, um, we go down to Capolo, and this is in the Scottish Cup, and it's the fifth round, but it's a replay, and uh, Commander ends full. Craig's, Commander Great's away support as well at that time. And uh, I'm playing against big Davy Hopkin, you know, having big red hair, teeth out, all that, right? And I wasn't great, and I just kept launching balls into the back, right? And Tam's shooting at me, oh, you, oh, you, usual stuff, right? And I'm fucking trying to ding him, <laughs> right? So big Hoppy gets up, back post, knocks it down, bang, one, nothing, Morton. And he's giving me dogs abuse during the game for it, right? And uh, 10 minutes to go in the game. Facing down all Davy Wiley's in goals for Morton. Tam Burns gets the ball, a couple of one twos, hits his worldy. I'm right and I know, right in the third corner. Davy Davy Wiley's nowhere near it. And Commander and just erupt. And I'm I'm glad I'm gonna give me stick for 90 minutes. I'm not gonna do it, I can grab you like you, but right. <laughs> so I just kinda of trickled back into the right back position, but I'm going, we're in the game, extra time. And they they did the board didn't come up, we played with the referee gave you. Craig. He went and done the same again, but I've no better. Right? Injury time. Injury time. Right. Oh, you know, Tom jinked, he jinked all the time on his left foot, his right foot, his left foot. Oh, a couple of one twos. Worldy. By Davy Wiley. Come on, they're, they're going berserk. Right down in the corner. So I was close to the plate the time and on. I went, oh, right, doing. Now's your chance, bums. And I remember this. I remember the stick they gave me, the stick he used to give me. <laughs> Singing a soldier song <laughs> against me at old firm game. Oh, man, now's your chance, Bunsy. Get in about him. So he's lying down, right? And he'll probably up there laughing at me anyway, right? He's lying down, face down, rocker players, red hair. I went, now's your chance. Horn right down. <laughs> Fucking ragged out him. <laughs> face down. He's like, he's, he's, he's got a <laughs> Is he trying to turn around and see who it was? And I'm a hundred and my wee black up with that. I'm like, what, not on the Rangers? <laughs> no, get up. Did he have I'm a phone? Bob Steele, yeah, it's brilliant. Not a clue. Story in the shows it and they're going, the fuck was dropping my heat down there? I'm like, shouldn't have sung a song, they're showing me a bastard. <laughs> oh, what the, what the name that was? Brilliant. But that was Tam. No, right. that was, it was just part of the club. Um, and that was my first wee dip in the water. Coming at 28 when I wanted, how you do players buy boozers? Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a couple of quid sitting about. I had probably had a mayor. If I hadn't had my, oh, they had my first divorce, but then we'll go, we can go to that if you want. But um, I had a couple of quid and I bought a wee pub in Darvel. But Burley signed me. George took me down to Air United. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't a great at Air. It was his first gig. He struggled a bit. But it was a great partner anyway. It was with Tom at Kelly. Again, managed to get a free, got a cut of quid off here. Moved down here. Initially, it was only part time because I wanted to get a boozer up and running. But eventually, he gets sacked. And Simon Stainrod came in. And Simon mm-hmm. made me club captain. Simon McGovern, who was my mate, was assistant manager. And Simon um, just used to enjoy selling a night out in there, basically. So there was three gringos out and about and doing my stuff. Um, so that was that was good times for me as well. I lived in here. I had the pub up in Davo, blah blah blah, and and it kind of worked out for me here. And then your swan songs Dumbarton, is that right? Your... Me and Sammy went to Dumbarton. Murdo sent me on the Friday night. My dad shouted up the stair. He went, "By the way, you got a new gaffer." Murdo had went to Thistle, left me. Fucking Dumbarton, I'm like, oh. it was a horrible times for me. Hated it. But that time, I'm one out again. I really am one out again. See, see, for a kid who's in the Rangers for your fourteen, do the apprenticeship, all that, the the you know the the, the cycle of pre-season, then the season, injuries, dealing with all oh, the banter in the show, the the, the, the banter in the showroom, that's a motor trade thing, mm-hmm. banter in the dressing room, and you wake up one day and you decide, that's it. What was it? What was the single biggest factor for you to decide? Right, that's the fact we're finished. Uh, Another stab in the back for one of my ex-employees. Um, I phoned Kilmarnock, spoke to wee Bobby to do a pre-season because I'd left them Barton and I still wanted to play. Still felt as if I could go part-time somewhere and, you know, maybe go for my badges and that was my thoughts. I phoned wee Bobby to come up and train at Kilmarnock. I was living in Presswick, up at 77, day a wee back pre-season and... Um, Bobby's like, I said, no be a problem, by the way. So there's a problem, I'll phone you back. But I'll speak to the gaffer just to clear it that you're coming up. He says, you can do your bit with us if he's got too many numbers with the first team. Now, the manager at Commander of the team is Alec Totten. 
And I went up with my own training gear. Uh, and I went into the... Lassies were all still same lassies that were in the room in the office. And I uh, asked for Bobby. Bobby came down and went, Masha, no bother. She says, we're just going to go to her park and do our bits and some doggies. And I went, that's perfect. That's what I like to do anyway. And uh, he came back five minutes later. She said, I'm just running by the manager. The manager says, can I do it? He's, uh, he's got too many numbers. And was this basically for the physical prep stuff? It wasn't the match stuff. It wasn't the end game. It wasn't the set pieces. It was just run around the park, running. do your gym stuff, get yourself your fitness up, and we'll get too many numbers. Totten. Assistant manager at the big joke at the time. Never a rang word, Bill. I always had a bit of a reputation when I played. I was a bit of a troublemaker. You can probably tell, right? You look at my clubs, right? See, apart from me, Doddy, I could jump far at Dumbarton. He was as good as an ash train, a motorbike, I know, to be fair. Right? But messed with him. Right, you know what I mean? I said what I had to say, Craig. I'm like that. I've got more pals than enemies. I'm quite opinionated, I think you know that. Mm-hmm. But that's what I do. I, I'm, I'm, Craig, I'm approaching 60. Yeah, I'm going to change. Mm-hmm. Probably not. No, I don't. So, just to get into this picture, you've turned up at uh, Rugby Park, you're in me cap bag, you're in training gear, just want to do some fitness and make a decision, maybe go part-time. 100%. Second, third division, somewhere last like year. And you're stood there and you get that. Is it that moment there you just say, nah, Bye. enough? Bye. Yeah, 100% right. So, but fortunately, you, you know, you've, you've started the, the, the pub a couple of years before that. Because um, I think a lot of football players, when they've got nothing, and they go from dum-dum-dum-dum-dum-dum, get to the end of one season, and there's no contract coming next, and they've not got a club, and they just think, right, that's it, my, my life's over. And then it's nothing to wake up for the next morning. I think that's probably why a lot of players get mental health issues, addictions can sometimes come into it and you don't cope with that so well but at least you had a, a wee run up to it where you know, you'd know you went part time you'd, you'd started the business you'd, you know, you'd, 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 you'd clued up, I want to get this pub up and running, so did you find it an easy transaction and maybe easier than others to just say, fuck it that's it uh, I, I kind of I kind of my first dip in the water with the pub game wasn't really that successful for me. I lost a few quid in the pub in Darvo. I didn't really know the ins and outs. I gave my wee da job in it and we had some we did it up really nice and all that, but it was probably about my second time when it was more successful really uh, than the first time. But um I think at 32, uh there was probably one more wee payday in me, and that was at the time the juniors were throwing a few quid about. And I got the phone call to go and do a wee bit for Lark Call Thistle. And again, they weighed me in, gave me a wee wage. But I didn't have that job to fall back on. I didn't really have anything like that. And at that time, I had a friend, and you know what I'm talking about when it comes to the car trade. I had a pal that worked in the car trade. He went, Burnsy, you ever thought about the car trade? And by that time, football, football is probably no really in my thoughts, even though I was just about to sign for Lark Hall. Uh, and I really deep down, I probably didn't want to Craig. It was, you know, to get another wedge, really, and get a few quid. I didn't want to. Anyway, um, long story short, sent me a lot call, got my money, trained two nights, and then about six months into that, uh, I was offered the chance to, to go to the car trade and get a career. And I can honestly say hand in heart, I think I've told you this and I tell everybody, it's the best thing I've ever done. It got me away from football. It got me out that environment. Oh, once a fat player, always a fat player. I'm not Disney. You can kick on after it. You can make a living. You can have good times and bad times. And I've been lucky enough. I've had probably made good times and bad times for a stop play. Um, so that was that. Seven years. Sold Reno for Douglas Park down in Irvine. And uh, it was a brilliant job. Um, football, I would go to the odd game, but I wasn't really that bothered about it. Uh, I then got married for a second time, like about a wedding cake. Um, and we bought some coffee shops down in Troon, Val and I. And um, it was successful times, we've done great. And then I went into the pub game again. And the last booze I had was in Presswick, 10 years, the Burns. It was a brilliant shop, ran it well, really enjoyed it. Started doing the after dinners, doing all the circuit stuff. And then um, quite lucky to get a wee break with the media because I was working with Bill Young. Um, doing some stuff with rock sport and things that are on the go. So I need to talk to you about that. Yeah, that, that's when you and I first met. Yeah, probably that was. And, it. Uh, 
again, you know, when I speak to you and the Swiss solos and the Bobby Russells and the Dave McKinnon, see the guys that were playing for Rangers when I started when you watch Rangers. I've probably met bigger stars, people that went on to more famous careers. But there's something about that gang. Mm-hmm. And I remember, um, I was a guest, we were doing a protest at the time and we were doing with Sons of Truth and I was invited onto that show quite a lot. And I remember Shuggy Burns, was, I remember who, the first show I'd done for them, get the, the, the ex footballer was, I can't remember who it was, and the, but in the next one it was Shuggy, and I went, Shuggy Burns, used to watch him. Right, so it was a, it was a, a thing for me, yeah. and um, we had some arguments, didn't we? Oh, I really, I really <laughs> to get a wee, get a wee ring dong, Craig. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was quite violent sometimes. That was <laughs> funny, right? I, just to line it up, now, it's no disrespect <laughs> to you. I'm not trying to knock you, but I, I didn't quite like Mike Ashley, right? uh, yeah. and I'm not saying you were a fan of Mike Ashley, but you were like a wee bit more reserved. You were like Craig, but this guy's putting money in. He's doing this, and he's doing uh, that. I, I just wanted to end the dough, didn't I? I, don't I, where I... But I mean, I, I remember. I think we spoke about it uh, so long ago, and I remember distinctly one night, and it, we'd maybe done four or five shows together, and I was in before you in the studio and I was sitting good through the paper and um you walked in and you went Biggin, you put your horn out and you went, You were right. And you shook my heart and I went, What? He went, I that actually is a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you had it right right away all along. Yeah. <laughs> you were right, yeah, you were right. But I mean it was not you know, I, I don't take any pleasure in that. It was no. just a, the, the, the the reason I tell the story is there's not that many people can do the um the um you know I'm sorry I go to rank yes. so many people yeah I, I, I don't think it picks up just go um so yeah it's just um you know there's not that many people I'd say you were rang it was just opinions nobody just bite your rang but when you went do you know what I've no your opinion Aye. and it, there's not many people have got that about them and I thought you'll do me well you know something that leads me on to, to media stuff right mm-hmm. because no many folk have got opinions mm-hmm. that sums up your media in Scotland right now mm-hmm. I've always wanted to do a bit media mm-hmm. um, be it for Clyde or for Scotland yeah, yeah. but when that doesn't fit mm-hmm. and, and, and you are opinionated you're never going to get a gig yeah you know, I, I'll, um, Big Sutton will get peppers. Big Sutton play acts a wee bit. There's no doubt about that, right? Keen speaks for the heart and he's not of his cup of tea. We don't have MD up here that, that I'll, when I'm driving through the city, I'll listen to. Right? I think I think the best out of them all uh, that knows the games, managed in the game and played at a high level is wee McCann. He's decent. But see when I turn some of the other media guys on, turn off. So what's wrong with honesty or the airwaves? Oh, but listen. You, you tell me what is wrong with somebody. Phone out with something. You, know, you ever hear anybody phone out with an Anne Clyde? No. Or, or no. Radio Scotland? She, she, I mean, I was, obviously I wasn't an ex-professional, but there was a wee two, three year window in my, my life where we were doing the protests that the media wanted to talk to me about yeah. a lot of stuff. So I, I got a fair amount of coverage in a short amount of time. And yeah, yeah. I had to go on a, quite a quick learning curve. And... I remember, I'm not going to you know, individuals at the time, but I, I was invited onto a radio show and somebody across the table from me had said something about me, a really derogatory thing on Twitter. Um, and he was a professional. And I was on this show where we used to always butt and cut you off and take control of the situation. And I'm sitting there going, oh, you're, you're better at this than me because you've been doing it for 30 years. You know, I'm, I volunteer at the game yeah, and yeah, you know, yeah. just you know, yeah. through the love of my club. And I fell out, I stopped him and I went, no, I stopped. I says, I'm not doing this again with you. I says, you do this to me every time I'm on here. You're a professional, you cut me off, you try and no give me like my, my space. I says, now that man there that's running this show asked me a question. I said, so I do apologise, could you ask me the question again and could you just shut up and let me answer? Mm-hmm. Never getting invited in that, that situation again. And the presenter, I spoke to him a year, two years later and he was apologising as much as he could and he said, you know, it was I couldn't get you back on, and without saying it, and well, that was it. It was just because I'm like, no, you, 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 what makes you think you're better than me? Why do you think that you can talk down to me? You can cut me off. You can try and use uh, all your tactics as a professional media person, 
to not let me hear my say, and I thought, no, why would I want to sit here? Now, again, something that I was quite proud of, every time you went in, they offered to give you your expenses, and I refused it, because I thought, no, because I'm here to say what I want. But the other guys in that table were all doing it for a wage. But I remember when Bill, when we were first on um, Rock Sport together, and I was talking to him, and I went, listen, this is me, it's okay, I'll be back, I think, are you all right? He went, that's what we want. Mm-hmm. And because they weren't a high corporate entity at the time, they could do it. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, you've got your Bowers, Control and Clyde, and you've got your BBC and, you know, all these and the big corporations that are in the media that, I don't think they've got the, the, the same sort of leeway. They're scared of people without the old bow busting, whatever. Yeah, because you're right. You, 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 you said some a minute ago there about it's their earner. That's what the pundits, they rely on getting work to pay their wage. I think there'd be nothing better than getting a gig to go and speak your mind as we're doing the new and throwing a few choice words in because at the end of the day, you're only giving me a thousand quid to come and do this. So, you're cheap. I thought it was two. Right, well, okay, whatever. <laughs> uh, just Hi guys, I'd just like to take a, a minute to talk to you about NordVPN, which is a company that I use their services. I use it majority of the time when I'm traveling abroad, when I want to uh, keep up to date with the programs I'm watching at the time, or more importantly to me, um, the sports that I want to watch when I'm abroad. So it doesn't matter where I am in the world, I can still watch the channels and the games and the sports that I want to. It also gives me security and some privacy that I'm looking for when I'm browsing the internet. They've got an exclusive huge discount available to viewers of the podcast and they'll give you an additional four months free on top of whichever package you go on if you use our, our code. To get that, plus a 30-day, no quibble, uh, money-back guarantee, all you need to do is log on to nordvpn.com backslash Craig, C-R-A-I-G, and that'll get you the exclusive discount plus the four months free on top of whichever package you go for. So go and give them a look, guys, and certainly I've had no problem using them in the times I'm travelling abroad when I mostly use them. Thank you very much. Something think with the man. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're doing it out of a uh, known one another, having a banter and, 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 and going back through the years and having an opinion as well. Our media is no opinionated enough. It's, it's boring. It's just rotten. I listened to Coist in the morning. Uh, him and Bazil were good. Um, but why do we not have that in Scotland? Yeah. But you, 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 um, you, you, you're in, you know, the, you, you did our TV work and, and stuff like that. Um, obviously, you were doing some um, hospitality stuff for Rangers. And, uh, uh, is that stuff that you still do? Uh, I think it's well documented that um, I love doing the Rangers TV stuff and, and being on the gantry with Tom doing all firm games, doing any kind of game, no matter who they were playing, was a very, it was, was an honour to be involved. And it just kind of came about. Uh, somebody had recommended me to Tom um, and the controller there got me in. It was at Air United, it was my first game. And Tom phoned me up back, says, I'm absolutely delighted. But um, the way he came across, you know, um, Rangers TV allows you to be that wee bit more, uh, uh, not opinionated, but a wee bit more, Towards, towards your top eye. Ah, nice. So, for that point of view, it worked great. Um, and and we were getting, I wish they probably get as much work as I wanted to do on the gantry. But there, there's, there's came a time when I went, listen, you know, I says, there must be something for me to be doing about the ground match days. Uh, not that I was begging jobs, not that I was trying to get anybody else's job, not that I was seeing myself as a, you know, a, a high flyer, but just wanted to, rather than sit on the gantry watching it, I would rather have done something, uh, you know, about the stadium. So I phoned Stuart Robertson and uh, I says, he says, oh, he says, listen, he says, there must be something for you uh, about the ground match days. And this was before the pandemic. Uh, I says, right, hey, I says, Stuart, that's great. He says, listen, I'll speak to Mark. Uh, he's in charge of the players on match days and this was Hately. I, went, I could really know much about Hately. did a few dinners with him. He did a few Q&As and, well, let's just say... It could have went better. Anyway, I didn't know him. Really didn't know him. Um, so I remember sitting in the house one Friday afternoon, the phone call came in. He says, uh, Hugh, it's Mark here. He says, I spoke to Stuart. We want to come in and do the last three games of the season and we'll see how it goes. There was no warmness in the, Hugh, I'd like you to bring you in. I'd like you to do a wee bit, blah, blah, blah. 
uh, and just let the punters know who you know what 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 they want to hear and, and I'm going really okay no problem uh, he's telling me what to say to a Rangers supporter right and I'm going right okay any problem Mark that's fine no problem it's so Saturday last year game don't forget it where uh, Aberdeen Hibs Celtic or Celtic Hibs Aberdeen just can't remember but it was the last three home games of that season first game in it goes into the, the, the we have a, a 11 o'clock uh, meeting over in the boardroom of our girl house and one of the head security guys takes it, Peter, some guy Peter that's been there a long time and uh, all the ex players are all there, we buds there, Steenie's there, uh, Ian Ferguson who I played with Fergie's there and one or two others. Uh, not really that many of them at that time. I think it's changing a wee bit anyway. Anyway, long story short, our into the, uh, the, the stuff, easy for what I talked to me about the TV, the 80s, the, you know, the upbringing and stuff. Easy for me. You know what I'm like? I don't need a mic uh, and comfortable enough to do it. So I thought, you know something? Um, I really enjoyed that. It's like getting your buzzer, get in there with a club tie on again, through the front doors, up the marble staircase, you're meeting Greggy, you're meeting the chairman, you're, you're, you're going, no holds barred, where you want to go, speak to people. <sighs> what a job that is. What a job that is. That's brilliant. Not a lot of money involved. I was there for the money. It was just there to be what to be basically working for the club again. Great. Three games in, close season comes. And I had heard nothing for Hately, and I was not like an oil Stewart, he was at the top of the tree. So I text Hately nothing back. I emailed Hately nothing back. A week later, I walked the golf course, read my phone, text for Hately. Hugh, unfortunately, I can't use your match days next season. End of. No phone call, no letter, no an email, no phone, nothing. A text. I felt very, very low. Um, Everybody's got things in life that they need to deal with. You touched on the mental health thing earlier, and I never came in when probably I should have, but I've suffered for a lot of problems, mental health through the years. Take my tablets, take my medicine. I'm not embarrassed to tell anybody that. Uh, folk think, oh, she'll get happy, go lucky. I, I guess there's a lot of dark stuff as well. And uh, I deal with it. I'd lost my dad. Um, I mean, through a divorce. I was really catering for turning up the road again. The way he picked me up was being back at the club and he took that away from me. I've never been back at a game since. This is what, 2020? Pandemic. 2019. I didn't realise that, Shuggy, sorry. I, I, I knew I you'd done I spoke to something. Bill about it before and uh, I, I, I go and see my doctor when I need it. Um, and, and right now, Financially, this is probably the most steady I've been for a long time with stuff that I've, I've came across and, and being with the right people and having one or two investments here and there, open the place in Burnside, we'll get that a plug, mm -hmm. speak about that later. Uh, depression uh, plays a big part in my life and uh, sometimes it's hard to deal with life when you're suffering for the way you are. I'm going to meet, I know mention, I'm going to meet another ex-footballer in my place in the next hour and a half who suffers really badly with it. He's a, he's a hand. No, it's, it's something that touches more people than, than, than we probably know. Um, I, I did the write about, but somebody wrote a book about me and put my name as a, the author. And then I spoke about um, some part times I had when I was, my marriage was on the rocks, I was working away from home, I was in London, a lot of pressures, and I, my head was in some very dark places. And I spoke about it, and um, the Evening Times serialised about um, just as uh, week before it came out. And one of the days they wrote the story, I think it was the Monday through the Friday, they'd done two stories a day. And uh, it was bizarre timing because we got told, he phoned me on a Sunday, okay, Chris Jack was the Herald. He says, Craig, I've got to be, I'm going to do this and this, but tomorrow is that all right? And I went, oh, that's great, aye, that's fine, that's great. Put them in. Phone me on Monday. Craig, I'm going to put these two bits in. Tuesday, you're right with that. Oh, brilliant, Chris. Cheers. It went down well. Yesterday. Thanks for plugging the book. Phone me on Tuesday. Craig, and I went to Crystal Gray Air, Chris. But I says, we've just been told my dad's dying. Terminal. No see the week out. I says, so all due respect, put whatever the fuck you want to. Yeah. Right? It doesn't matter to me anymore. 
And in hindsight, I probably, if he'd phoned me and he went, I'm going to put it about your depression, I would have probably went, going to no do that. Aye. Because it's personal. And if somebody buys a book and I need to talk about it further, they'd be fine. But again, it splashed through the front of paper. My dad's not read the book yet. My mom's not read the book yet. They might not be aware of these oh, situations. What's going on, yeah. So in hindsight, if there wasn't my dad's situation, he probably wouldn't have put it in the paper. My dad died on a Friday. Um, and I remember there was, a, there was loads of people very supportive of it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and one of them, and that, there was a load of people saying that they, you know, they'd seen stuff and signs of myself. And there was a woman contacted me. I can't remember how she got, no, she was a Fapa fan. She was a Rangers fan. She wouldn't have known who Sons of Truth were. And she said, uh, I think they've saved my sister's life. Because I read your story in the Herald and the Times, whatever paper she picked up that day. And she said, what you were talking about when you were in your darkest and you were planning things. I was planning things. I thought I'd convinced myself that the world would be a better place without me. My family would be better. And at that time, I thought my life insurance will not pay out if I do something about it. So I'll make it look like an accident. Mm -hmm. And I speak about it in the book. And she said, and what you're talking about in the sleep and all these things. She says, I've just saw my sister. She said, I've drove out to my sister's and I've said to her, that man's the same as you. There you go. And my sister broke down. And my sister says, oh, I'm that man. And she says, I got her the help she needed. Um, and it, it's um, it's a horrific thing. I mean, I, I was fortunate, touch wood, um, that I got through the other end of that. But you've always got it. It's just, and I tell you, David McKinnon, who was sat there last week, he's got a book out and I read it. And I said, David, you've just, something's just happened with your life. We, we convince ourselves. David, when he said he was younger, always felt when he was up here and he was playing for the Rangers and he was doing all these things, he was playing for the Scottish League select. So like, oh, it's got to be a trap because he'd issues in his, you know, his, his younger life as, as a kid that got a bit horrific to deal with. He says, but he always, when he was good, he was always shining himself because the bad's coming. He says, but what I learned in older life is, well, the opposite's true as well. See, when you're doing here, if life goes like that, then see, when you're here, you've got to go back. It's got to do yeah, well, and a lot of us don't, you know, we we always looking at night, and I thought it's a cracking way of looking at I th it. I think, uh, I think, um, I think what's probably helped me personally is, um, obviously, I was in the pub game, and and obviously, I meet a lot of players that they like it, like a drink, um, and, and can go to it very, very easy. Mm. Um, I've never been like that. I can go go mad with it for one night, and that's me for 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 weeks. And if my big pal. Yeah, uh, Chick is listening for a party or tuning in then uh, lay off me a wee bit. You're a bit heavy on me. He's a Champions League drinker. I'm a kind of third, <laughs> I'm kind of third division, right? <laughs> I struggle on a Sunday and then that's me off it, but he can go back on it again. And right. Good luck to the boys that do that. But I've been lucky that I've not had that addiction yeah, of yeah. needing to go back on it because the amount of boot and the balls I've had, um, I could easily have fell into that trap. Um. I remember, I remember <clears throat> going to Gamblers Anonymous, and there was a few people there I knew, uh, and I went, I went to a few meetings, and I suddenly then realised that my gambling wasn't anywhere near as bad. I like a punt, Craig. I like a, a, a wee flutter on the, on the foot on the golf. Uh, I, I knew it was probably the best thing I've ever done was actually going in. And you've got to stand up and you admit what you do. And uh, it was the best thing I'd done because a lot of people had lost everything. I'd never lost a thing through gambling. But I felt as if it was kind of got me a wee bit high. Man. And uh, it was the best thing I'd done. I met a lot of good people. I'm still people. Like, you imagine me getting into a gambler's and honest meeting and it's half the room are Celtic fans, half the room are Rangers fans. So Celtic fans are totally curious in what I'm going to stand up and say. And I suppose the Rangers fans yeah. are either. Um, and there is probably there's two really good friends that I'm still part of that still go to their meetings, uh, and 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 that was a good thing for me, and it was a good thing for me the first time I ever went to the doctor to admit that I was getting down. I, you know, I can only talk from my experiences, <clears throat> and I remember going through and getting to the other side. Of that. I decided what I was going to do one night, drive back to London, and something bizarre happened. I don't like talking about this very personal, but I never followed it through. And I thought, fuck me, I need to do so. That's not right. That's not normal behaviour. Mm -hmm. And I made an appointment, went in to see a doctor. And he sat down and he said, 
Uh, me some bizarre questions. I'm like, I'm here to see if I've got something wrong in my head, and you're mm-hmm. asking me. Just it didn't even make sense. Yeah, yeah. And he went through these lists of questions, and he says, "Right, you are clinically depressed." And it was like somebody taking a rucksack off me right there and then, because what I realised was I'm ill. I'm not a freak. I'm not. A, I'm, I've got something wrong with me. He then he wrote me. A, he said, "You know, I want you to go into the." And I went, "I'm not doing that." Sitting in a group, and going, oh, I'm, "I'm sitting." I can't do it. He says, well, <clears throat> I'll give you a script. He says, no, there's about six or seven drugs I could give you that might help you. He says, no, normally it'll take us a shot or two. That's the one I think will work for you, but I might be wrong. Take it, it'll take you two or three weeks to kick in, and then in another two weeks, come back and speak to me, and if it's fine, that's fine. If no, we might need to. He says, some, we normally need to do two or three before we get the one. Yeah, yeah. Sure, right? Yeah, sure. I went, no bother. See the minute he wrote me that script? I didn't get better. I didn't even miraculously become not depressed. Fuck, he's fucking damn sight the happier. And before, I remember walking out, and it was Rolligan, um, Stone Law practice, and the, 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 the so I walked out of doctors, and the, the, what you call it, the chemist is 100 yards up the road. Yeah. And see that walk? Hadn't he smiled enough right. as much right. in the space of months, maybe years? Because it probably went further back than I gave it credence in my life. And I did take the tablets. I didn't need them, and I, and I, it was, and I tell you what it is, and this is if anybody's listening to this, and they take anything out, any of the shite I've ever spoken, the 10 years that I've been doing stuff online and whatever, go and talk to somebody, it is the most refreshing thing you can, now you can go and talk to a professional, or you can go and talk to your pal, but another wee hint, because before I went to a doctor, I went and spoke to somebody else, that I thought, relationship would have should have helped and what i get told by that individual is tell me for it's just in your head mm-hmm. well of course it's right in my fucking head i've got a fucking mental illness where else is one yeah. man my, my throat yeah. so be careful who you talk to but and it might be difficult for people to go and talk to somebody and a, a, doc, a doctor's a great thing because it's just it's generally a stranger but talk to somebody because see when your feet are at the edge of that cliff or that's a metaphorical thing i wasn't jumping off a cliff it's, it's, it's tough to get back yourself, but talk to anybody, anybody you think can help. And so, you know what? See if you go to one person, you get an, I got a negative, and it fucking flowed me. Yeah. Because I was, I was, I'm going, I'm going to open up to this person, and hopefully they, they put their arms around me and, and save me here. Yeah. And totally. they, they, they done the total opposite. I think I've been quite lucky and all, but speaking to the right people, uh, and also the football helping me to be disciplined, to be keep my keep my weight as best I can keep it. Walk my wee dog. Um, I play three, four times a week golf. I go in the spin class. So I love the sweat. I love the, that working out. Um, and that helps me. There's no doubt about that. Um, and I think really, if any ex footballer would tell you, if they're still keeping themselves fit, that we mind still better than, than, than what it could be. It could go easily, easily be dragged down. Yeah. But, but my medication, I'm not embarrassed to tell people I take. Um, I, I, I probably mood swings more than anything with me. Uh, as you say, see that wee walk? I could, somebody come out my head and I could walk with Dougal, my wee spaniel, for an hour and be buzzing, and then something could negative could come into my head again and I could feel quite flat. Um, but I'm not saying I'm no, I'm good to be about. I'm, I'll still like my fun. But um, no, I think you're right. Anybody out there that's maybe no listening to our football, if they want to listen to their, their football players, are human. Uh, people as well, where we all suffer for things, and there's people playing the Premier League in England on 100 grand a week suffering for depression. So you know it, it's there, and it's never going to, it's never going to go away. When, when I, my, my, my deepest bits of depression, I was a sales director for a company in London. My company car was a six-month-old Jaguar, and sometimes it would be a Bentley because the guy owned it in a Bentley, and he quite liked the Jaguar. And sometimes I had me swap motors for a couple of weeks. Paid good wages. I had two kids. I had a new build house, detached house, and canvas lang at the time. And for the outside, oh, you know, like, what the fuck's he getting uh, happy with? Yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, I mean, when I've had my real lows, I've, fortunately, I've been low since. Uh-huh. I've never been as low as that period. And I think it's just managing it for there on in, isn't it? Yeah. But she actually understanding that it's just a thing. And you know, if you cut your leg, you would go get a plaster. 
If you get indigestion, you'll take a heartburn tablet. So see if you've got something going on in here. Aye. Why would you not do or take something to, to Yeah, to help? totally. You, you're talking about that wee walk for the doctors to the chemist. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm of similar thoughts when uh, I started doing match days. Um, that was for me on the back of walk. Aye. See, can I, just something that you were talking about there, Stuart, and I... Um, it's a bit bizarre. And I have this conversation has been right off and man, that I've never seen coming. It's not a deal with Fair <laughs> enough, you know, it's the fair play to you for bringing it up and, and carrying on with it. It's uh, it's certainly um could be helpful. If it's helpful to one person, it's been worth doing. But you've left Rangers twice, right? Once as a player and once as doing your, your bit with your hospitality. It seems to me sitting here. It's the hospitality one that you, you've, you get more. No, I'm, I'm saying you come across angry, but you're just like, I wish I, you know, you seem more disappointed that that ended than the playing one. You seem to have been able to accept the end of your playing time at Rangers better, um, which is a bit bizarre because it's a bigger influence in your your, your life. But you seem to be. Rangers are supposed to be this club that. Uh, you love them to the day you die and you would never see anything bad to them and it's good people that work for them. Um, for me, there's too many people in there that have a tie and a blazer and they couldn't fucking spell Rangers. Now that hurts me, not even financially, but the fact, and I'm talking, I'm talking no sour grapes, I don't care what anybody thinks, no sour grapes, but players that are in there come into that category. Are you talking players on the park? No, are you talking players, players in the hospitality players, end there? Player, ex-players that that are only there for money. And and that, for me, is uh, it's a no-no. Uh, I think, why, why would you need money to go in and do your bat in a match day? But there is players in there that, 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 that don't know the history of the club and, and not even there that long either, to be fair. So that, that kind of gets to me because I know what I'm good at and I'm, I know what I'm good at in my own circle and, and being good at meeting and greeting and talking to punters and, and being a part of it. Maybe the fact that I'm just not a part of it, uh, there's, there's a wee bit of jealousy there as well that I'm not involved when I see other ones that couldn't release my bits when it come here. But they fuck me as a player, they fuck me as an ex-player. There'll not be another opportunity, Craig. And it breaks my heart. The amount of people offered me hospitality. Why go to Game Shoggy? There's my ticket. Can you take you here, take you there. I watch the Rangers all day, every day when I want to watch them. And I watch all the games. Of course, I know the team and the shape and what have you and what's happening there. Hopefully, there's a wee, uh, there's a, there's a wee up, a wee up charge with that. But I'm, I'm still very, very bitter towards what the, what the club uh, have done to me. And is it fair to say what I'm saying? My perception is right that it's that seems to be more about the most recent one when it was a hospitality thing than than, than the player one. And but the player one should be the one because that's a bigger effect yeah. in your life. But is it fair for me to presume that that, that what I'm saying is right that it seems to be this recent one, which was what, still what, two two years ago, three years ago, uh, twenty? I uh, just uh, just just when they, they never they get the season finished, and they get the season finished when the lockdown happened. No, I said, get a league, we had about, we had about 10 games to go. Right, aye, right. So we had beat them just at the start of that new year. Um, and that was roughly... That wee run of games, yeah. Aye, that was a wee run of games. So for that point of view, uh, I can't see myself ever going back. I can't see myself um, pushing myself to go back. But all the opportunities to go back. You never say never. But I'm talking about as a fan. I'm talking about up my stands with the boys and having a beer and, and watching Rangers win games. That's what I want them to do. Um, so it's just not about me. It's not about sour grapes. It's just the way I've been treated. Um, that it's, it's a bad taste in my mouth, Craig. It's a bad taste in my mouth. Is that just because it was a text? There was not even a phone call? Was, is that, I think then I had to laugh because when when they get rid of him, he had said they didn't even have the decency to phone me. And I went, calm, my mate. Now you know how I feel. Now, Mark Hatley was a brilliant Rangers player. You've got to tell me Mark Hatley's a Rangers fan. So, that's how I feel about him. I, I think, like, see when you played with Kilmarnock, 
See when you played with United. See when you played with maybe not so much Hearts. But you, you, you would have had a passion for the clubs because you're the type of player and you're the type of person Aye. that you know you're in. If you're in, you're in. I can understand why it wasn't maybe the case at Hearts. And I imagine that you know Mark Kately when he played for AC Milan was dead proud to be an AC Milan, you know, involved with that club, Monaco and Portsmouth and the clubs that he played for. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think. I think you can get a, you can get it in. They can come. I mean, look at Big Butcher. Mm-hmm. But I think, with all due respect, a Terry Butcher and the love that he had for Rangers for at a time. To try and put that in a par with somebody with a similar, let's say McCoyst, isn't he going to happen? Yeah. So is it fair to say Mark Cately is not a Rangers fan? I think it's maybe slightly disingenuous to say that he didn't like the club. But I think you're right that. For us to expect, or anybody to expect him to have the same passion for somebody like myself, mm-hmm. who never had the honour of playing for Rangers. Yeah, it's still going to happen. It ain't happening, mate. No, no. Um, but I, I think... Yeah, but there is also a way of conducting yourself and going about. I don't think uh, he's the most popular of people anyway, going about the place. He is a bit of a big time, to be honest with you. And uh, you don't want to see that. You want to see Rangers players conduct themselves in the manner of mixing with this, that, and other kind of picks and chooses who he wants to talk to. This isn't a, uh, like just all picking Mark Hatley, but he had a big, big say on me not being there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I always said that if I have the opportunity, I'll call him out. I would call him out. There's not a date anywhere. I'd call it out to his face if I seen him. And he knew. I think I seen him in the town. I just, I just, um, I just moved on. I think sitting here as a pal of yours, I've known you for maybe 10 years now, Shock, right? And we've had some good laughs together. Um, I think to say never. I don't think you should. Um, Probably. Never's, never's a hell of a long time. Um, but I can understand it. Um, I mean, I've had things that have upset me. I've been, I was really fortunate I had three years working for Rangers. Um, some tremendous experiences. And I had some issues. Um, so, I, you know, I get that. I mean, I was not again, wasn't fortunate to play for the club. But you know it's like to be a part of it. That's the thing. Be in there. Mm-hmm. People knowing you, having a job to do, you know, any administrative job is the same as similar to a player's job. You're there representing that club, mm-hmm. no matter what you're doing. And you know the mad thing is, I remember my first contract with Rangers and looking going, is that it? I thought, no, we're no doing part-time anymore, right? <laughs> and I actually look back and without allowing for inflation, the last time I had made that amount of money as an adult, was when I was 21. Exactly. And I'm not saying, you know, take inflation on you, but I made when I was 21. Right. I'm talking about, I was in the motor train, I, was 20, I sold my first yeah. car before I was 18. Yeah, yeah. So you, you understand I was making no bad money, you were done it yourself. Yeah. Uh, and I made more money at 21 than I did working for Rangers in my mid 40s. There you go. Um, I think I, a lot of people saying that in life, but you know, that way your earnings know the way it was. I, and I, but, <laughs> I, you know, for talking about 30, 40 years, but I wouldn't love to, um, if Rangers had paid me more money, they'd have paid me more money. It would have made no difference to me. No, I know. That's, I got, I know I I got out of my bed in the morning and walked. I used to walk sometimes along Praise Road to go to right. And it was as if I was going again. Yeah, I get that. And every time I walk through the marble stair, I'd get ready to laugh, right? I had to get an office. And then, did you know, most of the offices in a girl house. And I went in, you know, I began to get a really f- apology to make. What's the apology? I've not got an office space where you're here, right? Would you mind working in an office in the main stand? <laughs> Can I wear my scarf? <laughs> Can I wear my scarf, mate? I'm like, aye, that'll be all right. So I get to walk through the marble stairs every day. That, again, that's where I have to report. I went to the office. My office was right next door. It used to be Broxy Bears. Then it was the office next to the way changing them, right? And I'm like, ah, these folk don't know they're living. I just saying to you, is it all right if you work in the main stand? And I was that humble and honoured to work for the club. I remember the first time I needed a shite and I was paranoid about where to go because I'm like, Bill Struff better than a shite here, I'm the main start. <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 I think I'll just hold it in again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you know, and then when you lose that, and you know, maybe one day I'll, I'll um, talk more about what happened with you. Um, and it hurt and I spoke. I'll tell you who helped me one day. I spoke to um, we were like, um we were Henderson, we right. took him out to Lisbon, which is right. a Street Football Academy, so we could see his Paul Eusebio's um, statue. statue. Yeah. And 
the next day to the night at the airport on the way back, that team was working for Rangers. He was working for Rangers that night at the European game. And I spent the afternoon in that coffee with him, really. And he could pick up there was something going on. And he says, Craig, you, you can't hold that. It's no Rangers. It's no Rangers. They've no, done no. it to you. Don't hold it. And you've got to let go. So he tell me, and I'm looking going, this is Willie Henderson. This is Willie Henderson that never played in Barcelona. That's right. And right? He, still, he still he talks about that, Willie. You know, you know, you get him started. But Steenie and Bud wind him up, of course, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. And if he it can takes let, a bit every time. Aye. <laughs> but if he can let go, for him to tell me to let go, and I was just a guy that worked in you know, the, the back surroundings for, for three years. And I didn't even tell him the story. He just, he could pick up, because I'd spent like almost three days away this trip worked yeah, yeah. with Willie. And uh, I said to me, you need to let go, son. I said, it's no, it's no sometimes it's... So don't go and know, say never. Go and anyway, know, that. Go and know. See, see um, I hope you've enjoyed your, your chat, mate. I've, I, I, well, listen, I'd like to keep going, but I've got a couple of things today. I've got... Well, I trust you, he's going to run out. We need to put 50 pence. In the I've, got, uh, but, I've got Dougal Burns over at the Groomers in Giffnup. And then I'm going to go and meet my wee friend yes. uh, at a new bistro restaurant uh, that is just... This opened. isn't in, in yeah. anywhere on the it, south side of Glasgow, is it? No, it's in Burnside. Wow. It's, it's the corner on Stone Law Road. And it's called Hughes. Hughes, the bistro. Yeah. And what's the specials that Hughes oh, do? Oh, we do everything bar fish on a Friday, of course. <laughs> um, we, 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 we throw in all sorts. We've got a great chef. We brought a, a chef over for Coyers and uh, we've got a great front of house staff as well. So we closed it, gutted it and rethemed it. In fact, my, my drink license just come in as well. So Seriously? Nice so what, what, what sort of uh, hours oh, are you open? Uh, I'll open the morning, 8 till 6 to now until we then put in the nighttime menu on. And uh, we'll have a wee bit of fun with that because Burnside's a dry area, Craig. There's no there's any, any pubs. You see Charlie Muller. Well, we Charlie... <laughs> Out with my best sauce. Does he get me wrong sauces? No, he's selling his buying waves. I didn't know that. I think we're too posh for him. He's doing it at Greg's. <laughs> <laughs> he's up by with the Greg's bag wave. I didn't know that. I'm getting the big. <laughs> uh, once you get a license, but I'll see him going to well, outside the tail. Saying, I mean, you can set up our own sauces and a bottle of beer with me in the morning. <laughs> A lot of the best for that. So mate. I know I'm looking forward to it. I'm not in it much. The, 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 we've, we've just did it as a wee investment and it's a great area. So uh, no hassle and just busy with our wee things in the go, so we're quite happy, mate. Well, let me add, I can't thank you enough for a few things for um, the laughs you've gave me over the last sort of 10 years that I've known you. Your fucking videos, I, I, I'm sick now, you've not sent me a mad video for a bit. The Rolling Villiers one, aye. <laughs> the Rolling Villiers. I was actually in Dubai, I did that. What? The house go on, the Rolling Villiers that one. That was, that was, I'd been out golfing with a pal of mine from Nottingham and I was steaming, and she's like, Do you Rolling Villiers? So I did the Rolling Villiers. <laughs> Right. See, else, I'm a, see my old firm morning videos right. you just said. <laughs> I'm not, get fired right up. I've deleted them right, you know. Right? Right <laughs> but I should see for all that, for that time, for the laughs we used to have in rock sport, um, for the daft banter, we're still getting WhatsApp together and for turning up here today. Great, it's been man. absolutely great, mate. I can't even thank you enough. Yeah. And I, I, I hat off to you. We've went into wee bits that I didn't Aye. see coming and hat it's off to you for talking life. about them. So have you enjoyed that? Brilliant, mate. Great, great set up here. I'll definitely, I tune into all your, your interviews anyway. And, um, obviously, you can tell them I was raging here. That's me, I'm sure I'm in this with some derogatory texts. <laughs> <laughs> so, he must have been looking for somebody to fill in the space. But no, I'm delighted to be here. It's went great. And God, we've chatted there for about two and a half hours. That's how easy. Right, then, it? But I went, anyway, no, all the best. Listen, mate, thank you very much, Shoggy. An absolute pleasure. I hope the troops love this when Thanks, it goes out. Mate. Hopefully. Okay. Cheers, oh. mate.